Hi guys, just uh, obviously as I promised in the video, sort of just quickly demonstrating MiniZing a bit. I will have included instructions and a link in the, at least in the description below of where to download it and a bunch of additional resources. So I'm just going to jump straight into two problems which I've actually written up based on a bunch of lecture slides. So you can see on the, the uh, this is actually from the, the first set of lecture slides, the full model from um, the back house, the... Which one is this one? Linear program model with two variables. The toy company problem. So uh, you can, you should be able to access the lecture slides from there and just take a look at the... Just just to refresh your memory, but I'm just going to jump straight to the full model and um, just sort of just show you the link between how... Um, just show you the link between how you would program it here in MiniZinc as opposed to the... Um, or pretty much just translating the lecture slides to what we have here in MiniZinc. I do apologize if the mouse point is going in the opposite direction, so I've got it on the, I've got my screens in the opposite direction, but we'll just go with that. So, uh, as we can see before, um, we've got, let's see, so let X1 be the number of soldiers to be produced each week, and let X2 be the number of trains to be produced each week. You can sort of see that I have that highlighted here in MiniZinc as variable integer soldiers, which, as you can imagine, is the number of soldiers to be produced each week and, var and variable integer trains. So basically what I'm doing right here is that I'm specifying a variable that is that can only take an, in an integer value. Now, um, there is a few different ways to do this, but for simplicity, I've done it this way, but in the next model, I will have done things a little differently. So moving on, uh, in, in, we'll just jump straight down to the constraints instead of um, doing the objective function first, but I think you, you should be able to see how things are put together. So if you recall the constraint that each week, no more than 100 hours of finishing time may be used, which is 2x1 plus x2 is less than or equal to 100. You can easily see that I typed it in as a constraint using the corresponding x1, which as you will remember is soldiers, and x2, which as you may remember is trains, and then it's less than or equal to 100. So if you're quick to pick up on the pattern, and um, pretty much the the same way that I've just copied the copied the title of each constraint into each comment, you should be able to see very easily how it is at least encoded in MiniZinc, in which I will agree is should be fairly straightforward. It should be fairly simple. Now, uh, uh, one thing about the non-negativity constraints is that Depending on how you define your variables initially, you probably will not need to write non-negativity constraints, but I will go that into that later. So, um, if we go back to the full model, you can sort of just see the link between each of the constraints and each and, uh, and the corresponding, um, line in the MiniZinc file. So, Let's head straight back. Let's um, go to the objective function. Recall that we are to maximize, maximize the Z function, which is 3x1 plus 2x2. And so here we, we say solve, maximize, at least in MiniSync, basically the, the model is telling MiniSync that we want to solve the problem and we want to maximize this function, which is 3 times x1 plus 2 times x2. Now, as to how MiniZinc works, once you've done the model, you can simply hit run. What what MiniZinc will do by default is that it will print out a list of all feasible solutions and it will stop once it's found the optimal solution. So you can see that it's starting at zero, zero, and then it's continually aiming to increase the profit. So you can see it's going from two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So you can see it's sort of like enumerating a whole bunch of examples, and it's just getting much larger until it finds an optimal solution. And basically, it's telling us here that the optimal solution is to is to um is to produce twenty soldiers and sixty trains per week, which gives us a profit of one hundred and eighty. And do apologize if the Bottom of the screen is cut off a little. There's a little bit under the bottom here, which I haven't captured in the window, but it's really not all that important. Now, the other thing to, um, the other thing I will point out that usually what you need to do is to have, is to configure the output to actually say, 
to actually configure it in the way that you want this. So for example, if I actually comment out the output and we'll just see what happens afterwards. So if I hit run, uh, yes, always save. Thank you. And basically it will just take all your, all your, all your decision variables and it will just print out the result for that. But for some people, obviously knowing what profit you want is important. So you will want to configure your output to show, to say something like profit is and then show the result. Um, as for explaining how the syntax or like the way you write this, I'm hoping it's a little bit obvious, but nevertheless, you will have this file to play around with just to see how things work. So let's jump to the next, um, let's jump to the next problem. So which is, this is the one from tutorial two, the single, um, the single, hold on for a second. If I, no, wait, hold on. Single period production model. All right. So this is the much more complicated model that we were supposed to cover in Cplex, but unfortunately Cplex was not working true to our preferences. So this is obviously a lot more complicated, but I coded it up in the same way that it was coded in Cplex. And um, so hopefully it should be fairly understandable once I've explained all, if not most of it. So we just if you just uh, quickly go back to this big, this table here, where, um, where we've got a whole bunch of information that we need to be able to sort of chop up appropriately. So I think, uh, what, what's, what's the easiest way to start with? I think, um, let's just, let's just go with the model all the way down and then I'll link them back to where they are relevant in the slide. And, uh, hopefully that will sort of just work out for me. <laughs> All right, so we've got the decision variables. Now here I've done something a bit different. I've done an array of one to four. That's basically telling me I, I'm producing an array of four units. So you know what, I'll include that as a comment. So you can say that it's like, um, there's an array of four variables in which I've set the bounds from zero to 1000. Now, the whatever maximum value or whatever minimum value you set is arbitrary, but I mentioned before that you can, you can, you can, you can not have the non-negativity constraints by setting the lower bound of this decision variable to zero. Now, the other thing I want to point out is that if you see, I've got it as 0, 0.0 and 1000.0. This basically tells the system that I want to treat this variable as a float variable, basically, or basically a variable that has decimal places and not just an integer. So here, let's just say the close. So that would be like, um, so that would be a four variable that would say number of jackets. Uh, and the next one would be number of hoodies. Uh, next one, number of pants and number of beanies. So if you sort of want to visualize what the array looks like, that's how it is in the way I've set this up. And then here with the, with the number of shortage, well, I think I'll let you figure that one out for yourself, but ultimately it's still, uh, another array of decision variables where, um, where there's just an individual variable in each of them. It's just that in this case, it's easier for me, as we will see later, if you look down the const, when we address the constraints, it's easier for me to set up a loop such that I could just iterate through each of them rather than naming them in individually. Okay, so now here I'm setting some parameters, which is actually all the hard coded information that we see in the left, in the slides on the right. So what's happening here is that here I've set a demand array of variable, which doesn't have to be a variable, but for just, uh, it's easier to say everything is a variable, but we're just setting these as constants. So it doesn't really matter so much. So. What we're setting here is the demand variable, which once you match the numbers, you'll be able to see that it links up with the demand row in this third from the bottom, third from the bottom uh, row. And then in the same way, you can see the profit uh, matches up with the unit profit. And then you can see the penalty matches up with the unit penalty at right here at the bottom. And then production, production time required per unit. That's this big giant table in the middle here. Uh, unfortunately, I can't highlight it because it's in full screen form, but never to worry. Now, the the one thing I want to point out is that here, 
here in this big file information is a two-dimensional matrix. And so when we do two-dimensional matrix in Minisync, um, each line needs to be separated by this vertical separator, or each row must be separated by a vertical separator in this regard, so that we can tell Minisync to treat it like a two-dimensional array. Array, my apologies. And in this, in the same way here, I've defined the array to be of two dimensions in which the number of rows is four and the number of columns is four. And I'm setting, I'm setting all possible values to be a float between zero and 1.0. And then I've called, I've called this matrix prod to be short for production time required per unit. All right. Last, lucky last is the process capacity, which again, you can see is fairly obvious. It's the process capacity in this right column. So that's basically like our maximum, um, kind of, kind of like our maximum, uh, capacity at the moment. So, okay. So now to explain each of the constraints, so I'll just head down to the slide with the relevant constraints. So the capacity constraints here, you can see them very nicely written out in each individual line. So you can see what they are, but in programming wise, because of the way I've set this up in terms of arrays and variables, it's much easier for me to say, it's much easier for me to set a loop. So basically, if you don't know what a loop is, basically a loop just allows us to iterate the same action, maybe with some, some things change in between. So you can see for all i in one to four, i and j are dummy variables. Doesn't really matter what they is as long as you, as long as you actually refer to them appropriately inside. So I think the, the easiest way to look at this is to go through each line example by example. So we take i is equal to one, then we take the sum of all prod, all production time times the number of clothes. So that's actually, if you, if you look at the slide, this is actually this first summation. So 0.3x1 plus 0.3x2 plus 0.25x3 plus 0.15x4. And then it's less than or equal to the process capacity, which is that, which is this first element because i is equal to one, which is equal to this 1000 here. And as a result, um, hopefully you will be able to see how everything else, how, or at least how the other three, um, three capacity constraints follow from this. Of course, it might take a bit of a while just to match the values, like say from this, this line to be i equals one, and then say this line is i equals two, i equals three, i equals four, and then of course the summation from one to four, that, so that's prod, so say if i equals one, there'll be like prod one, one times n close one, so n close is this one, the number of jackets, and then, and so on and so forth. So this is where it can be a little difficult at first to sort of just wrap your head around. But once you, or even if you do any programming, you will realize that it's actually quite, quite that, well, at least for me, relatively simple. So moving on to the shortage constraints, um, I've got, I've got, it's actually, it would be nice if these were written in separate rows, but hopefully you should be able to see what's going on. So it says for I am one to four, the number of short, the, the amount of shortage, which was defined before as S1, is equal to the demand. So the first demand would be 800 here, which you can see as 800 here. And then in the constraint, we've got minus N close I, which is defined before as X1. I actually, it's just occurred to me, I haven't, haven't really properly gone through the variables as they were on the slide. So it says, let x1, x2, x3, and x4 be the number of jackets, hoodies, pants, and beanies respectively. That's basically what I've defined here as array one to four. So maybe I'll just add that as, as a comment. So that would be xi equals, and here, here I'll just add another comment saying that's si to make it a bit easier for you. All right, so now, uh, where was I? Okay, object. Um, I've done all the constraints now, so hopefully, hopefully you're able to download the download this model and um, along with the, and just compare these with these these equations with the lecture slides, and um, that, that should hopefully after a while make things a bit clearer. If not, always you're always welcome to ask ask some questions and um, yeah. But 
Moving on to objective function. So what's the objective function here? Objective function is to wait, that's the multiple period, I am an idiot. Objective is to maximize net profit plus total profit minus total penalty. Now, I, in the model, I've sort of been a bit lazy here, whereas, uh, you know what, I should add a comment saying that this is the objective function. Equals total profit minus total penalty. And here, you can see, so basically here, I set as a variable which can be a float and I've defined it as objective, which is equal to, now this is the total profit and this is the total penalty. So hopefully that is very clear. And um, and here I tell, I've told Minizing that I want to solve this and I want to maximize the objective function. So now things happen a little differently here. But in the, um, but just to clarify, I've configured the same output as before, but if we just hit run, now you, you can see the output. Oh, oh boy, that's a shame. You can't actually see the output at the bottom, which is, that's actually quite annoying. So, you know, oh, there we go. Okay. So you can see the output at the bottom where I've got close 6.1.1111, 750, 600, 500. Now the, Obviously, you would need to know how to interpret this output in context of the original problem. So as I've said before, uh, let me move this out a bit so I can get a bit more space. All right, so with the close, as I've defined before, uh, the first the the first number in close is the number of jackets we made. The second number is the, the second number is the number of hoodies. Third is pants and fourth is beanies. And then in the same way, the penalties, or at least this is the penalty amount we get for having to put it in storage, where we put it in context of the original problem is 1.88888 and so on. So this gives us a profit of 625. Now, if we actually go down to the slide, that's actually not the optimal solution found in this. And one thing you will notice by now is that in the bottom left, it's still saying running. That basically means this, our program, or Minisync, is still trying to find the optimal solution, and in some extreme cases, it will take ages, maybe even the rest of the life, maybe even more than the rest of your life, to find solutions, especially to much more complicated problems. So, uh, I'll be honest, I ran this program overnight, it was not able to get a better solution in the period of time, but I also do not know how much time it would take to get the optimal solution found in this lecture slide. So what what I'm just going to do, or if you have a model that, that is just constantly running and it's stuck, you can, you can head right up here to the toolbar and you can just hit stop. And since, um, since basically MiniZinc is configured by default to give you all possible solutions until it finds some, it, until it finds a maximum solution, it would just, what you will have, at least at your solution at the bottom, is the best possible solution that is found at that stage. So, what I'm gonna do now, let's see how much time, 18 minutes. Um, okay, what I would suggest doing on your own is to, let's see if I can. So if we go to the Farmer Dave decision problem, as we found in the, the PRAC 1 problem, so that's um, tutorial 1, question 1. I would really, I would like you to take a look at this problem and look at the solutions and then figure out how to implement it in MiniZinc as well. And since you've solved it via the graphical method, you should be able to confirm that you have got the correct answer. So, um, yeah, happy MiniZinking. Hopefully this is clear and as always, leave a comment below or email me if you are not sure about something or you want or you just want to quickly check a model. So with that, thank you for watching.